This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Yuat. It's Monday, June 24th, and this is Africa 54. Mauritania's ruling party candidate is declared the winner of Sunday's presidential election. A live update from the Africa Cup of Nations in Cairo, Egypt. And communities in the U.S. connect with refugees through the power of sports. Tonight, we begin in Ethiopia, where a senior government official says the man accused of trying to seize control of Ethiopia's northern Amhara region was shot and killed Monday, and a number of other coup plotters have been arrested. The government accuses General Asamnu Sige of masterminding gun attacks Saturday night that killed five people, including the National Army's chief of staff and Amhara state president. For more on the latest development in Ethiopia, I'm joined by VOA Solomon Abate. Solomon, welcome back to Africa 54. Thank you, Esther. Obviously, Thank Solomon, you for inviting me here. Very shocking news coming out of yeah. Ethiopia. You're talking to sources over there. What is the latest development? You are right, uh, Esther. This was uh, shocking to many um, in the country and abroad. Uh, the latest developments are uh, it has been announced today that uh, the alleged ring leader, uh, General Asam Nozege has been killed um, in Amhara region. They said uh, he was killed when he tried to escape from his hideouts in, a, in an area called uh, Zenzelima, or uh, uh, it is called, also known as, as uh, Chembel. Mm -hmm. uh, the other development is one of uh, uh, the wounded during the attacks uh, Saturday night. The chief prosecutor of uh, the region uh, was, has been pronounced dead. Today. Now, Solomon, this is shocking. And uh, a lot of people who don't understand about regional governments in Ethiopia uh, are wondering whether this is a signal to a, an even serious problem uh, meant probably to destabilize the government of uh, Prime Minister Abiy. Um, the Prime Minister uh, came out... Uh, Saturday night and uh, he called upon all Ethiopians to remain calm and uh, he also said that this was an attack against uh, the people not only uh, uh, some uh, political leaders in the region and at the federal level uh, the army chief uh, was killed also as you said and uh, a retired army general was also killed uh, with him so uh, Many people are shocked in disbelief, um, but still the country remains calm so far, uh, and uh, uh, the communications are limited, in fact. The internet is no. down. Yeah. Communication is down again. The internet, internet, was internet down. Is, remains down, yeah. Wow. Now, this is a, a little bit worrying if you think about the region has been unstable, not just Ethiopia, but also there was another attempt. Remember when Abe just came in as prime minister? No, there was a grenade attack, an attempt on his life. Uh, what are the government officials and security sources telling you about what they are likely to do? What kind of move are they going to you know, put in place to ensure that situations like this uh, don't the, go unchecked? The, uh, the government uh, announced that the army has been ordered, received orders to take any measures to put uh, the situation under control uh, so far. But, uh, you know, uh, things are not very clear yet since uh, they are not very uh, proactive and uh, fast you know in communicating the developments and uh, they are not receiving follow-up questions from journalists so there are some uh, questions remain unanswered so far you know uh, for instance why they call it uh, coup d'etat since it is uh, uh, it took place in a regional uh, at a regional level uh, not at a federal level and uh, who are those people who uh, have been arrested, you know, with, uh, uh, in relation to this situation? Mm -hmm. And if they are taken to 
the courts soon and you know other questions so uh, we we shall wait tension. and see you know a lot of it's not clear in Ethiopia right now and a lot of concerns from Ethiopians abroad as well right uh, yes right. there are concerns all right S Solomon follow up this for us we'll get back to you as soon as we're able to on the next thank you very much thank you yes. all right that's a VOA Solomon Abate moving on to Northwest Africa uh, the ruling party candidate in Mauritania has been declared the winner of Saturday's presidential election according to the Electoral Commission. Former Defense Minister Mohamed Oldi Galzouani won 51% of the vote according to data published on the National Electoral Commission's website. Opposition candidate on Saturday held a press conference to call on citizens to take to the streets in protest if they believe the elections were not held fairly. The country's last elections in 2014, won by the then incumbent president, Mohamed Uldi Abdelaziz, were heavily criticized for being unfair and were boycotted for many, by many opposition parties. Saturday's elections were seen as the country's first democratic transition of power. Gazwani has promised to transform national industries to create more jobs around the country's natural resources. Now, for more on the latest developments in Mauritania, Reporter Isha Sarai is standing by. Good evening, Isha, and welcome to Africa 54. Thanks for having me, Esther. Now, Isha, the Electoral Commission had announced that the ruling party candidate obviously won the election, but also the opposition was calling for peaceful strikes. We understand that there are planned protests today. What more can you tell us? Yes, so um, there is, uh, there's been a call for a peaceful march, uh, emphasis on peaceful. Um, this evening uh, started a few minutes ago, um, and it's supposed to continue on into the evening. Uh, there were some reports uh, in some of the poorer parts of the city of protests last night that involved burning tires. Um, this morning when I went by, I saw some burned vehicles and some obvious evidence of fire. But, but notably, I think more than the actual protests, there is a very heavy military presence in the city. I think they're prepared for any um, potential protests or for anything to, to get out of hand. And also worth noting is that uh, it would appear um, that all cellular data, 3G internet services have been cut across the capital, if not the whole country. Um, we started hearing reports of this around 3 p.m. yesterday and until today. I, I still can't connect to any um, internet outside of my hotel Wi-Fi and I believe it's the same for most people in the city. So this is obviously not just a breakdown, it is a planned, uh, you know, a discontinuation of, of uh, services such as the internet, as you say, Isha, and even the cell phone use, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and of course, you know, there's no official word on this from the government, but, but most people on the street are saying that they assume this is with the intention of quelling any potential protests in the streets later. Isha, some people are saying 51% is too short. Is this likely to, uh, is there a runoff actually likely to take place? No, so um, so really what's what's leading to the opposition candidates calling for protests is that uh, Gazwani, the ruling party candidate, has won just over the 50% necessary um, to not need a runoff election. Uh, had he won less than 51%, it would have sparked a runoff election on July 6th. Um, a lot of people are, are skeptical of the results given how close they are to, um, to that percentage. And uh, I believe a lot of the opposition candidates are calling for a recount to, to spark a runoff election. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how likely that is given that, that technically from the numbers released by the National Electoral Commission, Ghazwani uh, has won enough to, um, to, win, to claim an absolute majority. Isha, what is the Electoral Commission saying about those concerns? Some saying, well, there should be a runoff, others saying there should be a recount. What is their stand? Um, I, I mean, the Electoral Commission has published their numbers and they stand by them. Um, there's been some question about it because opposition had called for foreign observers during this election um, and the National Electoral Commission declined. Uh, that being said, on Election Day, there were a lot of members of the U.S. Embassy, for instance, as well as local observers who were going to the polls and, and documenting any potential cases of intimidation. Um, but I believe that, as far as we've heard, uh, the National Electoral Commission is standing by their decision. Whether protests tonight will change their mind is, is yet to be seen. Isha, thank you very much. Isha, thank you. Isha Sarai uh, talking to us live via Skype from Nuakchot, Mauritania.
Now, in a bid to halt the black market demand for foreign currency, Zimbabwe announced on Monday that its interim currency will be the nation's only legal tender. The nation's current real-time gross settlement dollar was issued in February as a first step toward a new currency, a key part of President Emerson Mnangagwa's plan to stabilize a poor economy, racked inflation and widespread shortages. A published government notice revealed that all other forms of currency is being banned and will no longer be legal tender alongside the Zimbabwean dollar. And now to the ongoing 2019 Africa Cup of Nations in Cairo, Egypt, where Africa 54 sports reporter Sandy Shomari is standing by. Good evening, Sandy. Good evening, Esther Gidu <laughs> How are you doing in D.C.? I'm doing good, Sandy. Light up this news broadcast for us today with a highlight on what happened on the weekend. Esther, a lot has happened over the weekend. It was a bitter pill to swallow for the East African nations, except one for the ones in the competition. As you know, all of them four lost, except Uganda, after getting convincing win against their counterparts, brothers from another mother, if you like, <laughs> DRC, after winning 2-0. At the same time, Kenya lost 2-0. Tanzania lost 2-0 as well against Senegal. And Kenya lost against Algeria. So what is happening? I spoke to several analysts and coaches, but the players still see light at the end of the tunnel. They have never lost hope. They say the next game is going to be a winning game. But guess what, though? This is like Tanzania is saying the next game, they must win against Kenya. The same thing, Kenyans are saying the next game against Tanzania, they have to win and they will win. So what's going to happen is going to be a duel of brothers from different mothers, <laughs> Kenya and Tanzania. <laughs> Maybe let's take a listen to that. Uh, Okay, I understand we don't have it. Well, Sandy, now, today, sure. today the, a match has just ended between South Africa and Ivory Coast. What are the yes. highlights of the match? As you know, Esther, this was a great tough duel because South Africa has a great team, but on the other side, Ivory Coast has a lot of young talents. Almost all 11 players are playing abroad. So guess what? What has happened here was a towel, was a duel of big names in Africa. These two teams, both of them have become champions in Africa in different areas. So you can imagine it was a duel of the champions, but previous champions, of course. But what happened, one came on top, and it was Ivory Coast. In the 65th minute, Aston Villa superstar Jonathan Kodija scored a goal after finishing Wonlo's cross. So tonight, yeah. Ivory Coast is on top of the group after winning this game. But anyway, Esther, 10 o'clock, there's another nice duel mm -hmm. between another countries. These are like Kenya and Tanzania. Mauritania is playing tonight. Right. And Mauritania is here for the very first time, Esther, playing um, with Mali. These countries are very close. They're just like brothers as well. Okay. And Mauritania uh -huh. is coming for the first time, Esther. It's going to be historical for Mauritania. Even their president is saying to be in town for this game. <laughs> After winning the elections. Just After winning Sunday. the elections, exactly. <laughs> you just mentioned that. <laughs> All right, Sandy, so, so you're having a lot of fun over there in Cairo. Thank you so much. We'll touch base again tomorrow. Oh, Sandy, uh, yeah. before you go, yes. what else should we look forward to next? Oh, yes, Esther, there's a lot to look forward next. As you say, this is a big game coming tonight. Not only that you have Bafana Bafana losing their game tonight, but Esther Angola is also playing Tunisia. This is going to be 7 p.m. tonight. Tunisia, as you know, the Lions of Atlas are getting ready to win this game. But Angola, of course, is not a favorite team to win this game, but they say what? We are ready to face Tunisia. Okay. So this is one of the other tassels that we're waiting for this wonderful evening to come by in this area, Esther. Sunday. Hopefully a great game as well. <laughs> All right, Sunday, go get yourself some dinner and watch the match for us. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Esther, thank you. All right, that's Africa 54 sports reporter Sunday Shomari reporting live via Skype from Cairo, Egypt. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, 
harnessing the power of sport to transcend differences. We'll be right back. I am Sheikha Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent um, to most know, people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic. It is the beat, the African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the Voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com/africanbeat. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. A garbage dump in the Democratic Republic of Congo's bustling capital, Kinshasa, may be an odd place for most people to seek inspiration. But for Congolese musician and the founder of Fulu Muziki Group, Pisco Crane, this is the perfect place to find the recycled material he will use to create his band's unique sound. Using scrap metal, plastic bottles, tins or water pipes to make their instruments, the group has gained a following who love their signature rhythms and efforts to promote recycling in a country that produces over 9,000 tons of waste daily. Fulu Musiki says their music not only helps raise awareness on the need for recycling, but also shows how much can be achieved by individuals. In other eco-conscious news, tech startups in Germany have teamed up with supermarkets to create applications that alert consumers to groceries which are being marked down in price before the sell-by date expires. The aim is to cut down on climate-wrecking carbon dioxide emissions. Okay. Even the German government has launched a phone app offering recipes by celebrity chefs made specifically for leftover groceries, which otherwise may be discarded. While a growing number of businesses are participating in the cyber food sharing business, many others still give their food free to charities who pick up the leftovers at closing time and distribute them to homeless or other people in need. And finally, nail art is a growing cosmetic trend, but for Houston-based manicurist Jenya Malkin, it's become a miniature art form, giving her a chance to paint images precious to her clients. One of her most popular requests is to paint ultrasound pictures of babies in the womb on the nails of their mothers-to-be. The whole job, including painting the nails and the hand-drawn ultrasound, takes about two and a half hours. The price is about $150 with extra charges if more details are requested. And that's what's trending today. Welcome back to Africa 54. Now, the United States remains focused on Iran as the administration of President Donald Trump signals firm resolve towards Tehran days after Trump halted a military strike ordered in response to Iran's downing of a U.S. military drone over international waters in the Strait of Hormuz. VOA's Michael Bowman reports. The Trump administration continues to put Iran on notice. President Trump has hinted that a military strike against Iranian targets still could go forward. We have plenty of time. While his national security advisor has warned Tehran against mistaking U.S. prudence for weakness. No one has granted them a hunting license in the Middle East. As President Trump said on Friday, our military is rebuilt, new, and ready to go by far the best in the world. Amid the saber rattling, an expression of concern from a former U.S. military chief. My biggest concern is uh, the president is running out of room, running out of options, 
Uh, and while the rhetoric goes back and forth and how close we came to hitting Iran just the other day, that this thing could spin out of control. And the last thing in the world we need right now is a war with Iran. Meanwhile, Trump's allies in Congress are praising his handling of Iran to date. And the question is, uh, how do they respond to this relatively restrained response by President Trump? If they go back to mining tankers, shooting at American aircraft, this sort of pattern of activity we've seen, seen since April, then obviously the president has a whole range of additional responses that he could employ. But he's given himself uh, a lot of headroom, if you will. The United States reportedly has conducted cyber strikes against Iranian intelligence units while the Trump administration prepares to boost economic pressure on Tehran. We're putting additional sanctions on. Uh, they're going on slowly and in some cases actually pretty rapidly. If Iran wants to become a wealthy nation again, become a prosperous nation, we'll call it, let's make Iran great again. Does that make sense? Make Iran great again. It's okay with me. But they're never going to do it if they think in five or six years they're going to have a nuclear weapon. While tightening sanctions on Iran, Trump tweeted that he looks forward to the day when sanctions can be lifted. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. A little more sports for you today. And as the World Refugee Awareness Month continues, Activists are working to spotlight the stories of the nearly 69 million refugees and displaced people around the world. People from all walks of life are helping refugees connect with their new communities. Some local groups here in Washington gathered recently to do just that through the power of sports. VOS June So reports and Mary Ali Salinas narrates. On a recent Saturday, children and adults from across the Washington area had fun kicking soccer balls on a field of a local high school. Abdul Wahidi, whose family fled Afghanistan two years ago, was among them. There is the war problem in the school. There is two days school, three days not school. And my, my father decided to, to leave the country. When I come to this country, I start play soccer from last year. I meet some friends from African friends from other country. Uh, soccer make me happy. The first annual Refugee Community Soccer Day was organized by One Journey in collaboration with other groups. One Journey is a grassroots movement in the nation's capital working to raise awareness of the global refugee crisis. Today we had people, uh, refugees from the refugee community, as well as just larger community members, um, all coming together and playing soccer together. Um, the purpose of it is all to bring people together um, and to sort of show their common humanity um, over a love of soccer. One of the partner groups is Life and Change Experience Through Sports, or LACES. Founder Serene Fryett brought 40 refugee children. Soccer crosses cultural barriers. It brings people together, youth especially, um, kids who come from different cultures. You put a soccer ball in front of them and it becomes a common language. They don't have to speak the same language, but yet they can play with one another. And today was a perfect example and what the goal of the Refugee Community Soccer Day was is to bring groups of people together who wouldn't normally connect and find a common bond. That was Mohammed Hashimi's experience. I'm from Afghanistan. Playing soccer makes me feel really, really happy and really social. Uh, it's really fun to play and it's really um, a way to speak to someone else in a different way. Another nonprofit community group, District Sports, and Washington's Major League Soccer team, DC United, join forces to help children and adults work on drills and play different games. Uh, we're really happy to have our mascot and player out today and to really welcome these refugees to our community and the city that we call home. The organizers say the inaugural gathering was a success with 200 people joining in and they expect the connections they made to continue for years to come. For producer June So, Mary Alice Salinas, VOA News, Washington.
Definitely way to go. And there's no shortage of innovation when it comes to teenagers. So now we go south to South Africa where teenagers have assembled a four-seater airplane and it's flying across the continent. Aviation experts consider this a significant feat, one that will inspire teens who want to be pilots, engineers or anything else. Marisa de Clark reports from Eichenhof, South Africa. 17-year-old Megan Werner doesn't have a driver's license yet, but she's a pilot. Her You Dream Global non-profit helped a diverse group of 20 African teenagers assemble a light aircraft. Werner and some of her colleagues left Cape Town this week for a round-trip flight to Cairo. If you're a teenager and you already built a plane, you can say to yourself, well, I built a plane when I was a teenager. What else can I do? And then for the teenagers flying it across Africa, just to be able to make a difference and show people what is possible is really inspiring. Agnes Semela helped to assemble the fuselage for the kit aircraft, which the teens built under qualified adult supervision. I know for a fact that my team did their best, their absolute best, and I'm very confident that this airplane will make it to Cairo and back. During the maiden flight event, the South African teens saw their plane fly for the first time. Seeing that now it's no longer like about like adult people engaging in this industry, but also young people can get involved in such projects. I think it, it's going to inspire a lot of people to actually join aviation. With both her parents working in aviation, Werner's interest in flying is no surprise. The plane is crazy enough. It doesn't need to be that crazy that my daughter must fly across Africa by herself. So I thought, no, I'll go and check that she's okay. Because I've got a bit more experience than what she has and um, I'm there just to support them to make the right decisions. For safety, two adult pilots will fly a second plane similar to the one the teens built for the trip from to South to the, North Africa uh, and back. Obviously fatigue plays a big role that we need to manage with the students um, so that we can make sure that they are always awake, that they're always sharp to be able to make the right decisions. This is going to stretch their limits. The You Dream Global team will travel some 12,000 kilometers for the round-trip flight with stops in 11 countries. Along the way, they'll take other teenagers up in the plane to inspire them to also reach for greater heights. Marisa de Klerk for VOA News, Ekenov, South Africa. What a great story. Way to go, girls, down there in South Africa. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.